There is no such thing as zero gravity. I put it to you that the phrase zero gravity is one of the worst phrases ever created. It should never be used, ever, especially when talking about things space related. Contrary to popular belief, the astronauts and cosmonauts on board the International Space Station are not in zero gravity. In fact, the gravitational pull of the Earth on the International Space Station and everything inside it is around 89% of that we feel here on the Earth's surface. Now that seems ridiculous, doesn't it? Because they're floating around all over the place. So why are they floating if there's so much gravitational pull up there? Well, they're not floating. They're falling continuously. Let me explain. Imagine that you shot a cannonball out of a cannon. Now, after a few seconds, gravity will cause that cannonball to start curving towards the Earth's surface. But what if you could fire that cannonball so fast that it would never hit the Earth's surface? constantly bending towards it, but constantly missing because it's going so fast. Gravity is acting on the ISS and everything inside it, just like the cannonball. However, the ISS is moving just fast enough to keep it continuously falling around the planet. That is what is really going on here. And that is why the astronauts inside feel weightless, because they are constantly falling just like if you're in a constantly falling lift. So there we go, gravity is literally everywhere in the universe. Don't let anyone ever tell you that something is zero G. I've been Simon Dan, see you next time. The Great Wall of China is not actually visible from space. How many times have you heard someone say, or you've read that the Great Wall of China is the only human made object visible from space? Well. That isn't strictly true. You see, whilst at 21,000 kilometers long, the Great Wall of China is only maximum five meters wide. Now that is way too thin to be seen with the naked eye from the International Space Station, let alone the moon, which is sometimes what people say. However, that is not to say that the Great Wall of China cannot be seen with a camera or a telescope. This has been done a few times from the International Space Station, but the astronauts themselves will admit they cannot see the Great Wall of China with the unaided eye. In fact, if you do want to see human-made objects with the naked eye from the ISS, then it is actually possible. Astronauts have stated that they can see long bridges crossing huge straits of water, as well, of course, as the lights that you see when they travel around the night side of the planet. So the next time someone says that the Great Wall of China is the only human object visible from space, you can put them right. I've been Simon Dan, this is a Misconception Mini, and I'll see you next time. Is the dark side of the moon really dark? At some point in human history, probably because of the band Pink Floyd, it became general consensus that the far side of the moon was actually dark. Out of sight, out of mind. We never see it, so it must be dark, right? Wrong. It's no darker than anything else in the solar system, and in actual fact is light for half of its orbit around Earth. The moon is in a synchronous orbit, and its rate of rotation is what we call tidally locked with that of Earth's. This essentially means that the moon has been orbiting Earth for so long that the amount of time it takes to orbit Earth and the amount of time it takes to rotate on its axis is exactly the same. And this amount of time is 27.3 days. Now, to us here on Earth, this same face of the moon will always be constantly facing us because of this tidally locked orbit. However, the side facing the sun for the moon will constantly change. Think about it. During the new moon, where the moon is almost invisible to us, the dark side of the moon, from our perspective, is being constantly roasted with UV radiation. There's other flavours of radiation available, by the way. So there we go, the dark side of the moon is always going to be the side of the moon that's facing away from the sun, not the side that's facing away from us. Tell your family and your friends, I've been Simon Dan, this has been a Misconception Mini, and I'll see you next time. Black holes are not cosmic hoovers. Let me ask you all a question. If I replace the sun with a black hole of equal mass, what would happen apart from the obvious lack of light? The answer is absolutely nothing. 
all of the planet's orbits in the solar system would remain completely unchanged. That is because the Earth's orbit around the Sun is just so because of the Earth's mass and more importantly, the Sun's mass. Now, the black hole that we replace the Sun with would only have a diameter of around three kilometers. And that's because black holes are much, much more denser than stars. They have an incredible amount of mass squeezed into a relatively small area. However, contrary to popular belief, black holes do not suck everything into them. As long as your orbital speed is fast enough, you could fly around a black hole indefinitely. Black holes don't suck, they are not cosmic hoovers, and there really is nothing to be scared of. Hell, our solar system is orbiting one right now as we speak, and we've been fine for ages. Don't get too close though, unless you want to be spaghettified. And yes, that's a real word. I've been Simon Dan, this was a Misconception Mini, and I'll see you next time. Seasons are not caused by the distance to the sun. If anyone ever tells you that we have summer here on Earth because during that time we are closer to the sun in our orbit, then tell them to be quiet and listen. For starters, whilst it's summer up here in the Northern Hemisphere, down in the Southern Hemisphere, they're experiencing winter. Now, that isn't to say that the Earth's distance to the Sun is constant all year round. We have an elliptical orbit, much like the other planets in the solar system. In fact, during the Northern Hemisphere winter, the Earth will actually make its closest pass to the Sun. In early January, the orbital distance to the Sun is 147.1 million kilometers. We call this point the perihelion. By the time we reach our furthest point from the Sun in our orbit, we are a further 5 million kilometers away. This is the Aperion. And this is actually in early July, when here in the Northern Hemisphere, we're bang in the middle of summer. The main reason for the seasons here on Earth is the axial tilt of 23.4 degrees. This means that the Northern Hemisphere tilts towards the Sun in the summer and away from the Sun in the winter, and vice versa in the Southern Hemisphere. This tilt means that during the summer months in the hemisphere in question, they will receive more solar radiation and longer days than that of the days in the winter. If you live on or near the equator though, which is pretty much receiving sun all year round, you only get two seasons, wet and dry. So next time you hear someone claiming that the distance to the sun is the reason for our seasons here on Earth, then you can put them in their place with ease. I've been Simon Dan. This has been a Misconception Mini, and I'll see you next time. The sun is not actually yellow. You've all seen that well-established typical child drawing of a nice green field with a beautiful blue sky and a lovely yellow sun in the top corner. Now the sun does appear to be yellow in the sky and sometimes orange or red during sunsets, but the sun isn't yellow or orange or red. It's actually white. And let me tell you why. The Sun emits light from all wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum, from radio waves all the way through to gamma rays. And this of course includes all wavelengths of visible light. Now, all of the wavelengths of visible light combined give us a white colour. So from space you can clearly see that the Sun has a white hue. However, here on Earth, the Sun's light has an atmosphere to pass through. It just so happens that the Earth's atmosphere is very good at scattering the indigo, violet and predominantly blue wavelengths of light in all directions, which is why the sky looks blue, a phenomenon called Rayleigh scattering. However, it's not very good at scattering the yellow, orange and red colours, which means they can pass through the atmosphere a bit easier. This is why the sun looks yellow during the day and an orangey red at sunrise or sunset where almost all the blue light has been completely removed due to a thicker portion of atmosphere it has to travel through. So next time you see a child's drawing with that lovely yellow sun in the top corner, tell them that the sun isn't really yellow and it's actually white because of Rayleigh scattering in the upper atmosphere. Only joking. Tell them it looks great, of course. I've been Simon Dan. This has been another Misconception Mini, and I'll see you next time. NASA did not invent Velcro. Velcro is a brilliant invention, isn't it? A super hook and loop design which allows you to stick anything to anything. And although they were widely used on the Apollo missions by NASA, 
they didn't actually come up with the idea despite what you may have been told or what you may have read. Velcro was actually invented by a Swiss engineer called George de Maistrel in 1955, but how did he come up with the idea? In 1941, George was out on a hunting trip in the Alps with his dog, Milka, and he noticed that burdock burrs, a tiny little seed with hundreds and thousands of microscopic little hooks on it, kept sticking to his dog's fur. Now he spent the next 10 years researching how those burdock burr hooks actually worked. And in 1955, after some help from friends in the textiles industry, George de Mestrel registered his first patent for his hook and loop fastener known as Velcro. But what about that name? Where does it come from? Well, it's a combination of the French words velour, meaning velvet, and crochet, meaning hook. So basically, hooked velvet. So there we go. Next time your friend is trying to impress everyone at a party by saying that NASA invented Velcro, you can put him in his place quicker than a hook goes in a loop. I've been Simon Dan. This has been another Misconception Mini, and I'll see you next time. Does caffeine actually dehydrate you? I am an avid coffee drinker. I love it. First thing I do when I wake up in the morning is make myself a coffee. Whenever I'm out and about, I will make every excuse to find a coffee shop and purchase some of that caffeinated goodness. But does it really dehydrate you? I'm sure a lot of you out there are wondering that. Well, fear not, because coffee is actually extremely unlikely to make you dehydrated. Coffee obviously contains caffeine. So does tea and chocolate, by the way. And caffeine is classed as a mild diuretic. Now this essentially means it's a substance that makes you want to pee a little bit more than normally. However, experts have confirmed that the amount of water in a cup of coffee actually offsets any dehydrating effects that caffeine may have. And in fact, coffee can count towards your daily water intake. And in 2014, a study was done to prove this. Researchers compared the hydration effect of coffee with that of water amongst 50 men who typically drink up to three to six cups of coffee a day. The men were asked to drink either four 200 milliliter cups of coffee, containing four milligrams of caffeine each, or just water. The findings revealed that there was no difference in hydration levels between those that drank the coffee and those that drank just the water. In other words, you don't tend to dehydrate or lose fluid more easily when you drink coffee instead of water. Having said all that, of course, it's still a good idea to drink a fair amount of water during the day. So there you go. Unless you are drinking copious amounts of extremely strong coffee, then you're not gonna be walking around with a mouth like the Sahara all day. Go and grab yourself a coffee and have a great day. I've been Simon Dan. This has been another Misconception Mini, and I'll see you next time. Are fortune cookies really from China? I remember the first time that I tried chicken and sweet corn soup. It was on a lad's holiday in Tenerife and I was blown away. I'd always been a fan of Chinese food, but this was something else. And on that fateful day, we also opened a bunch of fortune cookies and we all laughed and joked at each other's destinies. But what I didn't know back then is that fortune cookies aren't actually from China. Now, because of these little after dinner treats, which sees three billion produced per year, you would be forgiven for thinking that fortune cookies are ingrained in Chinese history and culture. So to find out where they really come from, we need to go all the way back to the Japanese 1800s and then the American 1900s. In the 1870s, some sweet shops in Japan were selling a folded cookie with a hollow center called a fortune cracker. It didn't have the well-known vanilla flavor of today though, it was made with sesame and miso instead. This cracker likely ended up in the United States in the late 1800s to early 1900s when Japanese immigrants came to Hawaii and California. It wasn't until 1911 where a local LA bakery called Benkyodo changed the flavor to the buttery vanilla style we know today and found out a way to mass produce them. Now this is a point of contention though because three other sources claim to invent this modern fortune cookie at around the same time. Now, after the Pearl Harbor attacks in 1941, Japanese businesses in the US began to close, which left a gaping fortune cookie hole in the market, which the Chinese Americans happily filled. So there we go. Next time you'll find yourself about to crack open a fortune cookie after a meal, why don't you tell the tale of how they came to be at your table? I've been Simon Dan. This has been another Misconception Mini, and I'll see you next time.
Did Vikings wear horns on their helmets? If I asked you to describe me a typical Viking, you'd probably come back at me and say something like, a fierce Scandinavian warrior with axes all over him and a horned helmet. The Vikings were a large group of Scandinavians who spent their time raiding, pillaging, exploring and colonizing, who between the 8th and 11th century raided half of Western Europe and settled in most of England. I do actually have some Scandinavian DNA. Despite their well-known history and common appearance, there isn't actually any evidence to suggest that Vikings ever wore helmets with horns protruding from them. Very few Viking helmets have ever been unearthed, and the only complete helmet to ever be found didn't have horns on at all. It is more than likely they wore basic skull caps made of iron or leather to protect their head during combat. So why then are so many Vikings depicted with these horned helmets? For that, we might have to thank a 19th century costume designer called Carl Emil Doppler. He incorporated horned helmets into the costumes worn by Viking characters in a popular Wagner opera. Additionally, Swedish artist Gustav Malmström depicted Vikings in horned helmets in his collection of illustrations titled Frithjof's Saga, published in the 1800s. Whatever the reason, the horned helmets were here to stay from then on. So, next time you see a Viking depicted wearing a horned helmet, you can impress all your mates and tell them the real story. I've been Simon Dan, this has been another Misconception Mini, and I'll see you next time. Subscribe here, definitely click that one. 100% click that one. Uh, and then more videos there. De I mean, click that one as well if you want. I mean, they're there, so you may as well click them. Uh, that one's quite good, but you know, equally that one too.